have a discussion with you. And it seems most of you have seen my style before. You know what it's going to be. There's going to be a few questions, and then uh, we discuss, and then I lecture in between. Uh, so the idea is to uh, give you an introduction to to rhetoric and analysis of argumentation, also called dialectics. We'll soon come into why that is so. And um, that's going to be today, and that's going to be on Friday. Today is going to be easier than Friday. <laughs> Just so that you're in good shape for Friday. <laughs> okay. Um, So the first thing we want to discuss is why uh, why is uh, why is it worthwhile to study rhetoric? Well, one very basic reason is that if you are interested in in communication, which uh, I hope most of you are, since you are in the Master in Communication program, uh, then uh, we might say that the first well-developed theories and methods of communication or simply rhetoric. You want to turn off the lights? Yes, okay. Um, let's see how we do that. Does anybody know? Um, is this the light? No, it's uh, probably not. On this side? Yeah. 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 Very good. Excellent. You have to be Russian to see that immediately. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first well-developed theories are are uh, rhetoric, and therefore um, it's worthwhile spending some time on. On, um, on what rhetoric is, which we will do today. And if we look at when communication as an academic discipline was established, which happened in the United States in the 1940s, uh, we can see that the discipline of communication often came out of departments of English and speech, and speech was just an American word for rhetoric. And we can also see that you're in, in the last 30 years, if I go back 30 years, Sweden, we come back to the 1970s, Swedes did not talk very much about rhetoric at all. There were hardly any rhetoric uh, type educations at all. It all started again. Sweden used to be uh, a home for rhetoric if we go back to the 1600s and 1700s, okay? But in the 1800s and early part of the 1900s, for some reason, in Sweden, rhetoric disappeared as an academic discipline. But in the, in the 1970s, it suddenly came back, starting in Uppsala and then spreading to the rest of the country. In other countries like France, England, America, rhetoric has always been there to some extent. Uh, but one can say that it's had its ups and downs, and during some periods people have been very skeptical of rhetoric. People have said that it's only there, you know, to fool others and so on, and uh, other periods they, it's been very much more appreciated. And I think we are in a, in a, in a period now where it's uh, becoming more appreciated again. We can discuss later on. Uh, so, and, it, and when it becomes appreciated, people usually find, and we'll see what you think, that going back to antiquity, to the actual classical stuff on rhet rhetoric, is surprisingly good still. Resilient is the word I used there. And you will see, I think, we'll see, it's still interesting and useful. So, there are two basic ways to study rhetoric. One way is the descriptive way. How do people actually argue and try to persuade others? How, for example, if we had a, a salary negotiation, what do people actually do in order to try to get a higher salary? If we study that, if we get access to data like that, we can 
we can study that. And that's one way, the descriptive way. The other way is the normative way. How should we argue? How should we go about trying to persuade other people? What's the right way? What should you say in order to get the higher salary? Do you know? Um, have no idea? No. Never negotiated for your salary? Well, it's not about really about negotiation. You have to you have to have some kind of a leverage to actually succeed in negotiation. It's like you can just even though you can speak and have a good talk, the boss isn't going to be able to see the salary should be done bad. You have to have some kind of a leverage. Love back, back that speech up. You see? That's your this is personal experience? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, see that you'll see later on that it's very important to have personal experience. In, in rhetoric, we're going to call it ethos. You know, so he, he has been through this himself, so this means that we have reason to believe him. You might still not agree with him, but you know, he, he has a basis for what he says. Okay, so anyway, if we studied what he actually did, then we would have, but now we could of course ask, you know, sit down, did you do the right thing, what should you have done, would this be the right way to do it, that's the normal question. How should we do it? <coughs> and if we go through the history of argumentation analysis and rhetoric, we'll see that there are far more books and texts written on this subject, how should we do it? Of course, you can then say, but did they ever study how pe people actually do it? On what, what, was, what was that normative opinion about what we should do? What was it based on? Yeah. It was probably based on intuitive observations, and not really on, sci on systematic scientific studies. But that doesn't mean that th those intuitive observations were wrong. They could have been, I think, they're probably in many cases right. We'll see. Okay, so, but it still is true that if we want to get further with this, especially if we want to do it scientifically, if we want to understand what people do in order to persuade and argue, we have to collect more data on how it's actually done by people. And I think also that's, that's an essential basis for being able to give recommendations for what people should do. And so we, we are, especially if we want to teach rhetoric and argumentation to students like you, or if we want to teach them even earlier in school, which might be very important in fact, in the Swedish school system, one of the goals is to teach students critical thinking. But nobody ever tells us what that's really supposed to be or how they're supposed to acquire that critical thinking. Now, my opinion is that one of the ways to acquire critical thinking is to learn this stuff. If you can see how people can trick each other, how they can argue, how they can persuade, and you can see through that, then that's an essential ingredient in what critical thinking might be. And of course, that's what we also hope that university students will be able to have. You're smiling at the far end there. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I know you already. I know you have critical thinking, so. <laughs> good. Uh, Just a quick question. Will yeah. you be putting this online later? Because you're going slightly too fast. But what I've said so far, I'm sort of repeating the same message, you know, with slightly different words. Give me time to you know, write down. <laughs> okay. Well, we can put it online, yeah. Awesome, thank you. But, but still continue to make notes. Because if that means that you sit down and relax and you don't take notes, it's not a good idea. No, no, I do take notes. They are just not a story because I don't have to write as much. No, you should take notes. And you should reflect critically on what I'm saying if you agree or you don't agree. Just please put it online. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so we can give better recommendations if we can connect with the needs of, of learners of rhetoric and argumentation. But still, I don't think we can start to give recommendations about argumentation and rhetoric without knowing about the traditional ideas. 
and so and there is, there is a rich supply, as you will see, of traditional ideas. And so, if we want to start to try to teach critical thinking, critical arguing, etc., etc., I don't think we'll be very successful in the end if we don't know about some of the traditional ideas. Okay. So now we're going to go into some of these traditional ideas. So. If we go back to antiquity, and if we go back to all of the rhetorical traditions of the world, we'll see that nearly, well everywhere, actually there are ideas about the right way to talk to a crowd of people, to persuade them of something, or the right way to talk to the emperor if we go to China, to persuade the emperor or something, or the right way to talk to the uh, ministries of government, etc., etc. We can find such texts on things like that. In China, we can find it in Egypt, we can find it in Samaria, we can find it in Rome, we can find it in India and various places. In fact, we have a separate course later on this term, as you know, cross-cultural rhetoric, where we will go into some of these different sources. But there's one place which in some sense is unique in the world, and that's Greece. Why is it unique? Because in Greece, they tolerated open disagreement to a much, much greater degree than any other place. If you look at the Chinese advice, it's always to be respectful and to show respect to those who are older, who are wiser, who have more knowledge. If you look at the Greek stuff, no, they don't say that. They don't say that at all. You're allowed to call another person a scoundrel, you're supposed to give good arguments to it. Why was it like that? Well, for some reason in some of the Greek city-states, they started to have trials by having ordinary people be judges. And you had to acquit yourself by giving a good argument where you convinced the, the judges that you were right and they had majority vote. So this is actually, as far as I know, a Greek invention. So they used to have an uneven number of people who were judges. So like a Greek number, for example, in their... They also, later on, they transferred this to politics. So one assembly would be 501 people, things like that. Okay, so they would have uneven... Make sure there was an uneven number so that you could always get a majority. So if you were accused of stealing something, the way to quit yourself would be to go in front of this board of judges and give a good argument to show, no, 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 I'm not a thief, I'm taking nothing. Uh, you had to do this yourself. You could not have another person speaking for you, so you couldn't have a lawyer or something. That meant that in Greece it became interesting to teach how to defend yourself how to give a good convincing speech. And so, there was a group of people usually known as the sophists, who used to go around teaching how to give good speeches, how to persuade. This became even more popular when some Greek city-states changed their political system to what is now called democracy, where you would convince a group of people that this is the, what, the decision we should take is this and this, and, and again, a majority decision would, would uh, be the rule. This means that for some reason then, the Greeks developed a tolerance to, to large amounts of disagreement, uh, to be quarrelsome, to actually even in public insult other people. They had a tolerance for this to a greater extent than in most other cultures. Okay, so that's probably why there was a lot of thought devoted to how to argue, how to uh, persuade people, etc. Now, there were many people who were doing this, but it seems that the only thing we have left, in a sense, of traces of, some, of people who tried to summarize is the summarization that Aristotle, well-known Greek philosopher, did of rhetoric. So one of the books that Aristotle wrote, wrote is called Rhetoric. And in this book, he summarizes what he was able to learn 
about argumentation from the sophists. Okay, and in doing this, he also, uh, in, a, in a sense, summarized another thing which was going on in Greece. Namely, there was a kind of a debate between sophists and other sophists. And, okay, the, the team that we know most about are the sophists that were also called philosophers, lovers of wisdom. And in this case, we, I'm thinking about a particular person, namely Plato, and his hero, Socrates. As you perhaps know, there was a Greek philosopher called Socrates, but he didn't write anything. But his student, Plato, wrote down what Socrates said. And Socrates is the hero of most of Plato's dialogues. And in these dialogues, Plato meets sophists. And, well, usually they're sophists, but sometimes they're other people too. And usually then there is a debate between them. And one of the um, arguments, or one of the things they argue about, is what a good argument is. Okay? Plato basically and Socrates always think that a good argument is an argument which leads to truth. So you, I say yes, you say no, and you argue for a while, and then out comes the truth. Because you've tested your beliefs against each other, and this somehow gives you access to truth. People that Plato and Socrates argued against said, no, 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 that's not the important thing. The important thing is just to convince other people. Get a majority on your side and make a decision in your favor. That's what we should do. And so, okay, if you believe that a good argument is an argument that leads you towards truth, then you are engaging in dialectics, okay? So this is truth-seeking argumentation. Now, this word dialogue, dialectics, etc., it, it all has to do, dia means through in Greek. And lex or logos, many different words, all mean something with language or thought. So, and there are several different Greek words which have this root. Okay, so dialectics is truth-seeking argumentation. Now, some of you come from Russia and China, right? Especially those who come from China, where Marxism is still believed in, at least officially. Uh, you know, that Marx took an idea from Hegel. Hegel was a philosopher of history who thought that he could describe how history had developed. And he, his idea was that history is somehow a reflection of the world spirit. And the world spirit is thinking in a systematic way. And the history is all about the world spirit getting clearer about itself. Okay? And the way the world spirit gets clearer about itself is, wow, well, by truth-seeking argumentation, by electics. So have you heard about the dialectics of Hegel, the dialectics of Marx? It comes from this. It's an idea that, that the development of history can be inspired or metaphorically thought as the argumentation around a seminar table, if you like. So, how many people believe in this? Only one? I? No. Sometimes I believe it's true. <laughs> you should think about it more deeply. It's not so stupid as you might think, you know. It's a good idea in some ways. <laughs> okay. But anyway, that's why the word dialectics also comes up when you talk about Hegel, Marx, etc. It's actually the same meaning. Written. Okay. The other word then that people were using is rhetoric. This course is about, uh, and rhetoric is how you convince or persuade people in public speaking. <coughs> this course is about both. Okay, so of course if you're Socrates then you say the best way to convince people is to provide a good argument leading to truth. If you're most of the Sophists say the best way to convince people is through their emotions, sometimes irrespective of truth. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned how do you convince, persuade people in pu public speaking. Uh, that's rhetoric. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, is, uh, is rhetoric just come in uh, like uh, oral form only? Uh, or 
can it be also in a like a written form? Well, already Plato, so to speak, was putting it down in written form, right? His yeah, dialogues are or reproductions of arguments. Yeah, after it were they were spoken. They were originally spoken. Yeah. That what what the focus of interest for all of these people is actually spoken communication. Multimodal, also gestures and so on, as we will see, are important. Speaking to a crowd or arguing with another person. But you can also speak Absolutely. to a crowd in written form. Speak to a crowd in I mean written form? Communicating. You can communicate with a crowd in written form, yeah. yes. D can you call that also a rhetoric? Uh, yeah, I think so. Bo both dialectics and rhetorics can be applied to, to written form. But it's, in a sense, secondary. When the primary source of inspiration for these people is face-to-face -face communication. But of course, uh, when you become a skillful writer like Plato, and later on, many people actually in Western uh, science, also in Chinese actually, uh, started to write down the arguments of philosophers in, in the form of dialogues. Uh, it's a way of, of reproducing the argument. Th and that will, of course, have some of these rhetorical and dialectical aspects. No, so it's, it's a fairly old tradition to also reproduce it in writing. And then, even if you don't write it as dialogues, if you just write the text, you can still, many of these things are, are applicable. When we get to Roman times, you will see that, uh, well, writers are already then thinking about how you should write things. No, so then, yeah, that's fine. You can apply it to writing as well. <coughs> yeah? Um, I read a book about democracy, and in that book the author was uh, making a claim, and then a counterclaim, and then a counterclaim to that, and he was continuing like this, and it's a very thick book. Beautiful. So he's like he's, <laughs> it's like he's playing chess with himself. Yeah. So could you, could you say that that's there like this too? That's very nice. That's exactly the way you should do it, <laughs> if you're on the dialectical track, yes. Yeah? Yeah, he's very classical there in his approach. Okay. So, Aristotle, in his summary of rhetoric, made many contributions, and I have not enumerated all of them here. Here I have some examples which are well known, but there are more. Okay, the first one is the syllogisms. And this is the way Aristotle showed us that there are, if you use certain words systematically, namely words like all, some, not, and be, and you think about what the, these words really mean, then you can always produce valid logical inferences. I'll give you examples of this in a little while. Okay? So, and this has remained through the ages something uh, which uh, people have thought was correct and valid. And in fact, people then went through this and they summarized and they, they there, I don't remember exactly how many there are, but there are more than 10 valid syllogistical patterns. And um, during the Middle Ages, uh, they would learn them by heart. They would have a kind of list of, of valid syllogisms, Barbara, Solarant, etc. Okay, so they're all things like, um, what should I say? All Swedes are tall. Arvid is a Swede. Therefore, Arvid is tall. Now you can see the difference between logic and, uh, and empirical truth. So Arvid is sitting over there. He's not so tall, I would say. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but logically, if it's true that all but Swedes are, are tall, tall logic, logic and you are a Swede, then you must be tall. Yes, you yes. persuade me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a valid logical inference, however not an empirical truth. So right now from the start, learn the difference between logical inference and, and empirical truth, right? So something is wrong with the premises in this. What's wrong? 
false which are told must not be true. But a premise does not have to be true, right? It is just a premise. And so logic gives you, in the conclusion, whatever is true in the premises continues to be true in a logically correct conclusion. But if the premises are not true, then the truth in the conclusion is not going to be better than the premises. It just bring, it brings with it whatever was true in the premises. We'll see this, okay? Okay, another thing that uh, Aristotle uh, contributed was this idea that there are, when you're arguing or thinking of how to persuade people, there are some cognitive places where you can always find arguments. So uh, let's say we are talking about, uh, I don't know what, work. Some of us had a talk about work last week, right? Work, work bound communication. So I would say, you know, it's, it always feels good to work. And then he would say to me, I don't know about that. What do you actually mean by work? Give me a definition of work. Okay. Then what he would do, he would use a topos, namely the topos of definition, which is a handy thing to have in any argument. If you feel that some person is, you know, talking a little too widely, a little too loosely, then just stop that person and say, I, I don't really understand what you mean, could you give me a definition? And some people are good at that, some people are less good at that. <laughs> but, it, but it's an example of a topos. A place to stop your thinking and to get a good argument. Evaluation in general is a kind of topos. Try to evaluate, and there are many ways to, to evaluate what people say. Are they, are they speaking grammatically correct? Are they speaking beautifully? Are they etc. Et there are many, many kinds of evaluations you can make. Cause and effect. Right, so I go up to him and I say, uh, nice weather today. Now you think, cause and effect. So you guys say to me, why are you asking? Why are you saying that? Why are you saying that? <laughs> That's the top of some cause and effect. <laughs> it's often, it's often valid. I mean, it can often bring it up. It's for very many things there is, there is a cause and an effect. And if you have something to say, you can bring that up. <laughs> so you get the idea what topos is? Kind of subject areas which are... You, you learn a list of these and you can always think of things to say in arguments and so on. And you can use them to test the strength of what somebody is saying who is trying to persuade you of something. Okay. Then he had the idea of... Um, Categories. And what I've written here is that categories are possibilities of predication. Maybe that's a little abstract for you. But so if I say this chair is red, okay? That's a predication. It's a statement. It has a subject and a predicate. This chair, subject, is red, is predicate. What kind of predication was I making? Well, you could say I was making a predication of quality. I was giving you a property or a quality of that chair. So if I say, the red chair is standing over there, I would give you a predication of place. If I say, there are six chairs on the front row, I would be giving you a predication of quantity. Fantastic, you're getting this. <laughs> okay. You get what these things are. So they're possibilities of predication. And um, in Aristotle's view, there were 10 such possibilities on an abstract level. So he had 10 categories. This idea of such categories has then come back in the history of philosophy. And some of you perhaps know about the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. And how many categories did he have? How many philosophers here? He had 12. So he added two. And he also gave them a slightly different status from what Aristotle had given. For Kant, they were cognitive presuppositions of how we understand the world. For Aristotle, they, for Aristotle, there are possibilities of predication. 
Aristotle also contributed another concept, namely the concept of practical syllogisms. These are ways of reasoning that will help you when you're trying to get people to act. So, for example, you like oranges. Is that true? This is an orange. Let's just pretend. <laughs> Action. Yeah. Eat the orange. <laughs> Buy orange. <laughs> Grab the orange. Okay. So, if we have these lines, you like oranges, this is an orange, grab the orange. Does that follow logically? Grab the orange? No. No. In no way does it follow logically. But it's a, maybe a good basis for action, right? It's a, it, you know, you like oranges, this is an origin, or, orange, orange, which you can have. Then it sort of is easy to see that for most people it would not be good to just grab the orange and eat it. Okay, that's what a practical syllogism is. I'm giving reasons which easily lead to a particular action. They are not logically valid, but they would motivate you to take a certain action. Not logically valid. <coughs> okay, now we come to empty memes. These are, um, again, ways of reasoning that are not logically valid. They're not like the syllogisms. But they are very common. And people will tend to believe in them and think that it's correct. So, um, let's see. Uh, we take a common proverb. Uh, you and I are going to meet tomorrow, okay? And I say to you, early bird catches the worm. You understand? You don't understand. Okay, does anybody know what early bird catches the worm means? You do? What does it mean? No, is it like if you wake up early, you are going to be making a lot of stuff during the day? So come early? Yeah, it means in, in, in other languages, like in Swedish, we say, Moron stund hat gold in Mund. In German, the same way, Morgen stund hat gold in Mund. So it's, it's the same. Uh, the best time to do something is the morning. So if I said that, then it would follow from that that we should meet in the morning rather than, than the afternoon, right? Okay, so if you believe that that's a kind of valid premise, an argument, you know, you give a proverb and you draw a conclusion from that, then you're engaging in conventional wisdom, you might say. It's maybe plausible in some sense because most people believe it, but it's not a, a logically true argument in any sense. That's an empty meme, okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, the proverb you just said, yeah. like uh, the early bird, yeah. which is uh, the worm. Which is the, yeah, the fattest worm. Yeah. So in, in, there's a contradictory. Um, uh, uh, um, there is another proverb that says uh, the um, the light of learning shines at night. Which <laughs> one? <laughs> um, it has something to do with the the, the dog and the bones. The dog and the bones. Yeah. English proverb. I just, yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone know the I, proverb? It's about I, a dog in the boat. It just escaped my mind. I'll dog. try to think Okay. It. Does it have to do with what time of the day you should work? Yes, I want okay. to use okay. it. Okay. Now, it, you don't expect proverbs to make logical sense. I mean, they can very well contradict each other. I mean, there are lots of proverbs around. Uh, some people have had the experience of working in the morning and they like it, and other people probably like working at night, so they've invented another proverb. That, that's, uh, we cannot expect uh, the proverbs of a language or culture to be logically consistent. That would be to expect too much. But if you use such things in your reasoning, then you're engaging not in syllogisms, but in antimies. And all of the, these things are resources that you can use when you argue.
Okay, so here's a question for you. So now, just reflect on this a little. Should we study and teach these ideas at the university and in school? Okay. Any reactions? I heard somebody saying something. You? Yeah. Uh, Speak up so everybody hears. Yes. We should still um, study and teach these ideas because I think uh, in almost every aspect of, of uh, our daily lives, you have to. You were asking him if he would convince his boss to maybe increase his salary or something. Yeah, right. So we always sometimes, although he said that uh, it doesn't work, you have by just giving an argument. You have to have something more, but sometimes maybe just a good argument could actually convince uh, um, your boss to increase your salary. Or in other situations, like um, the idea about um, yeah, you mentioned something earlier, but. Um, Sophists, the best way to convince people is through their emotions. Emotions, yeah. Yeah, irrespective of truth. So sometimes maybe you can have, you can find yourself in a situation, and then you use convince somebody through emotions, and then you get the problem solved. So I think that um, studying rhetoric, uh, argumentation is very. So you can promote your self-interest by yeah. <laughs> learning these things. Exactly. That's basically your argument, yeah. right? Is anybody who thinks that it's not useful, that this is a you know a bad thing? Nobody. I mean, you should consider. You know, you remember Adolf Hitler? He was pretty good at this. And he had a minister called uh, Joseph Goebbels. He's also pretty good at this. And they were able to uh, manipulate large crowds of people to do what they wanted to do. Uh, to know this, these things does not necessarily have good consequences <laughs> always. I mean, then, yeah. But if, uh, like, the rest of the people know these things, wouldn't, uh, they would know how they speak and uh, know the background for it. Exactly. That's why this is an essential element of l teaching critical thinking. Yes. If you know some of these tricks, then you can see when people are using them. <laughs> and you don't have to be manipulated the way that people have been manipulated in many countries. And that's going on still today. Yeah, yeah, yeah but when you mentioned uh, Hitler and uh, knowing this, yeah. is, like I said before, you have to have some kind of a leverage. Hitler did. Hitler, I mean, every time when you make a convincing argument about convincing people, you have to have a little bit of either truth or something that people believe in. Because you can't convince someone if you don't give him something that he, he can actually believe in. It's like, it's not only that I saw aliens, you know, let's say if I did, and I would try to convince you that I saw aliens, that they, they, they do exist, no matter how good I would be in that, you still wouldn't believe me unless I gave you some kind of a leverage that you convince you or some kind of a something that you need to believe in. Words are not enough. So your concept of leverage is uh, something I think we'll see after our break can also be called with other words like ethos or a good argument or support for arguments and so on. But I agree. I mean, that, that's basically when you have rhetoric and orientation, you have to have good support, which is convincing to people. It's the same with lying. I mean, every, every time you, if you want to create a convincing lie, you have to have a bit of a truth in it. But otherwise, it will not be a convincing lie. It cannot be. You cannot be effective liar, liar if you don't have a, at least 10% or some small, small there must part be some of possibility in your life of uh, actually. True. Somebody is not disagreeing? Let's hear. Yeah, why? Because there is no evidence uh, that we can see on anyway that there, is, there are aliens and UFOs, but there will always be people who will believe in it anyway. Exactly. You always gather people. Exactly. You're lying without the truth, but people. Yeah, but you see, I cannot convince you with only rhetoric, with just words. Yes, that's what I said. Words are not enough. 
yeah, but nobody's convinced. They're not convincing anyone except themselves or the people who actually want to believe. You know? Yeah. But those I think people. In your, in your concept of leverage, you have many different things. Exactly. Now it seems that you're uh, including, let's say, empirical observations. Yeah, but or not only like that, that, some people are more, more like they want to believe, so they're more right. acceptable. Okay, okay then back to this. That's triggering emotions. Let's take a little break now and come back after the break. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, here is a typical syllogism of the type that I already gave you an example. All Greeks were proud, Socrates was a Greek, thus it follows Socrates was proud. No problem. Oh, most of it. Notice that the words in blue are what gives this structure. All were was, and then the conclusion. So we have two premises, one and two, and one conclusion, three. This is the classical way to do a syllogism. You should have two premises. You could have more, but this is, this is the classical form. Now test your own lo logical ability. Not one Greek is not proud. Socrates was Greek. Does it now follow that Socrates was proud? Yes. Who says yes? I say yes. Only one person? I say yes too. You say yes too? Two people? <laughs> Anybody say no? You say no? Yeah. Why doesn't it follow? <laughs> okay, let me show let me show you something. Uh, let's see here. This this is called this is simplified set theory. It's usually called Venn diagrams. Have you heard about this before? Some of you have. Okay, so we have here all Greeks. These are the Greeks. Socrates was a Greek, so all Greeks were proud, that means that if we have the proud people here, all Greeks are within the proud, okay? Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Now we put in Socrates. No, yeah, Socrates was a Greek, so he's going to be put in the inner circle because he's Greek, right? But the inner circle is in the outer circle, so therefore he must be proud. Mm -hmm. Now let's read number one. Not one Greek is not proud. That's true about this, isn't it? Yeah, in logic it's true, but in reality it's not true. <laughs> well, in reality, you, you think great Greeks are not proud. They are... Uh... <laughs> 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 We're not... We're... We're not yeah, no, concerned it's, with it's, it's not like that, but I mean, not all people are proud of themselves. It's, it's, in logic... Uh, in logic, we abstract away from reality in that sense. We don't really care if Greeks are proud or not proud. <laughs> we, just, we just make this statement and then we see what follows from it. But can you all see that the, what, not one Greek is not proud is actually this diagram also. Mm -hmm. right? Socrates was Greek, same way. So it actually does follow. And we had two people in here who saw, saw that immediately without the Venn diagrams. You are uh, promising as logicians. <laughs> you, you should study logic. <laughs> yeah? Can there be a little problem with is and was, though? With what? Is and was. Yeah, and why in this particular case? Yes. There could be, but why? Okay, here. Yeah. Okay, you're right. That's good. You're also promising logician. <laughs> Can you explain to us why there could be a problem? But you're absolutely right, yes? Because when we are saying is, we are talking about the Greeks who are living now. now. And Socrates was Greek. Exactly. So. so we might be going too quickly there. It's not clear that was true today, necessarily was true. No, you're absolutely right. So that could actually make this one uh, perhaps not so true, but it's not because of the uh, equivalence between 
all and not one is not, right? That is an, that's a logical equivalence. But the temporal question, yes, you're right. That weakens the argument. Good. We have three potential logicians now. You should all become potential logicians. <laughs> Probably you are. <laughs> OK. So you can see that what we were doing is all predicates can be replaced by variables. The only thing that matters are the logical words, all A or B. X is an A and X is a B. So that, that's what we were doing. Just, you know, we could have spoken about Frenchmen or Italians or whatever. Doesn't make any difference. Greeks and proudness is not what's at stake. And so here is another one. Students of Mick are good communicators. Bill is a student of Mick, Master in Communication. Conclusion, Bill is a good communicator. Okay, you can see that it's the same, right? It's not no difference. Now we get to the Stoics. They also were working a little later than Aristotle, but around, you know, in antiquity. And they developed a logic which was not based so much on all and is and not, but it was based on what we nowadays often in grammar call conjunctions, but in logic they usually call connectives. And so we have and, or, not, if, then, and if, and only if, then. In logic that's often written as if with two f's. Okay, so here we have Betty or Bill is a good communicator. Bill is not, then it follows that is. Yeah. So, and if we want to do that in logic, we, we see that there are two sentences here, in a sense. They are pushed into each other. So actually we have Betty is a good communicator, or Bill is a good communicator. And to show that we don't really care about what sentences, it could have been it's snowing or it's raining. No, it doesn't really make a difference what, what the sentence is about. So to show that, we introduce a sentence variable. And that's what we have here, P. And then we introduce a special logical sign, or OR. And that's the little V. And does anybody know why, why it is a V? It's short for the Latin word for OR, which is VEL. That's why. Okay, so this is P or Q, and this little sign means not, not Q, therefore P. So that's the same as this. And when you learn elementary propositional logic or sentential logic, then that's what you learn how to read. Okay, now I want you to talk to your neighbor. And I want you to invent two syllogisms, one valid and one invalid. Of a uh, valid syllogism. Yes. Speak up now so they can hear you. Uh, all human beings are mortal. All human beings are mortal. Okay. James is a human. James is a mortal. Yeah, that seems. <laughs> Correct. James is a mortal. No, James is a human, therefore James is mortal. Unless you're a Highlander. Unless you're a Highlander. Yeah. This is really cool. Okay, now let's hear. Yeah, you. Uh, we said no valid one. We said all Chinese love green tea. Yeah. Anne is a Chinese, then she loves green tea. Follows. I agree. Okay, did any, let's hear some invalid. Yeah? There's something I didn't understand about that. That was a valid signal right? Yeah, yeah. all Chinese love green tea. Anne is a Chinese. Yeah. Then so she, she loves, loves green tea. But is it really, does every Chinese person love green tea? 
But in logic, we are not reliable. It doesn't have to be true. In logic, we have to we have to think like this: if if it is true that all Chinese love green tea, and it is true that Anne is Chinese, then Anne loves green tea. That's the way you should think of it. If, okay, it's not, we're not really, the logic guarantees only the truth which might be in the promise of premises. It doesn't guarantee that the premises really are true. Yeah? Uh, I just thought you asked about an invalid one. Invalid, yeah. okay, let's hear it, yeah. Well, I have, all Swedes are not tall. Yeah. I am not tall. I am not a Swede. Can you see that that's invalid? Let's do it with these uh, Venn diagrams. Let's see. So all Swedes are not here. Here we have the tall people, and here we have all the Swedes. And there is a little overlapping area, area there, very little. Okay. Yeah. All Swedes are not tall. Yeah. So here we have the Swedes. And here we have the tall people. I am not tall. I am not tall. So you are somewhere outside of this, let's say you are here. Yeah, I am not a Swede. But you could have been here. Yes. And so, that I should have drawn the X there. That shows that this is an invalid premise. Does everyone see that? Or invalid, an invalid conclusion? Yeah. Yeah. I have an invalid one. Yeah? All students pass the exam, Anna failed, then she is not a student. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, you can see that it's not always, you have to think a little before you see it's not a dream about it. But. Okay, and if you feel if you feel a doubt about uh, whether it's valid or invalid, it is helpful to draw circles of this type. Then you can see usually more clearly what's going on. Good. Now I want to ask you this: Can you see any use of understanding of elementary logic? This is elementary logic. Yeah. I think uh, this exercise was very useful uh, because it helps in understanding the stereotypes or like the general uh, projections and so on. So yeah, it's like uh, it helps in understanding the elementary logic of things. Okay, so you, you appreciate that, yeah? I think it helps in reasoning and finding arguments. Right. For something. Well, if you spend time thinking about logical inferences, usually your mind gets a little sharper. And it's part of this critical thinking. You can evaluate truth-seeking arguments if they really lead to truth, given whatever premises people have, have stated. So it, it's actually part of sharpening your mind to, to see if they're all valid arguments if you're actually getting closer to truth or not. So that, that's, I think, the bottom line in, in trying to defend why logic is still an important part of the uh, curriculum of, of dialectics and rhetoric. Okay. So Aristotle's rhetoric contained other things than syllogisms. And so one of the things he stated is that Rhetorically successful communication should always combine logos, ethos, and pathos. And what are these things? So logos is what we just looked at. The kind of factual argument, the logical structure of the argument. But it could also be things like if what you're claiming is actually true. So it's actually both logical validity and empirical validity is part of logic. This is what the people who believe in dialectics, they actually stress only this point, in a sense. This is the Plato-Socrates line. They stress this. And they are not so concerned with these two. Ethos, or ethos, <coughs> is convincing people that you are trustworthy. Like you were saying, I have experienced this myself. I have 
you know, been trying to get a higher salary. And I, so then he, uh, he's experienced this himself, so we must believe him. That, that's a typical way of establishing ethos. There could be other ways of doing it. Anybody have an idea? How would you convince people that you are trustworthy? Yeah? By getting relevant training, for example, in that area that I'm trying to convince people. And how would you show people that you have the relevant training? To the diploma. <laughs> <laughs> so you come in, trust me, I have a diploma. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make them know that I, I have it. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, or you could use your title. I mean, there are a lot of. I am professor, you know, so I, I know about this. <laughs> Yeah, you could do things like that. Are there any other ways? Yeah? By discussing. Distracting. Dis discussing. Discussing. We discuss, and maybe in that discussion, he realized that maybe he can have, uh, he can trust me. Or by experience. Mm -hmm. By uh, experience uh, between uh, two of us. You're thinking of a situation where you have two people uh, discussing with each other. Yes. Um, Normally, this is in the situation where you, know, you have one person trying to convince a group of people. Okay, so you, you wouldn't really have a chance to discuss so much. You would have to show it in what you were saying to the group. Yes, like politicians. They are talking, I will do that, I will do that, and I did like that and like that. And why would you believe, if, if Obama says, we're going to, last year, State of the Union address, I don't know, he had... 25 different things he was going to do. This year he had apparently only had two. So did we believe him last year? Was he trustworthy? Yeah? Well, I think that as more sure we talk about something, as more trust we will get. So like Obama, he was very sure he would get this, 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 what he was promising. And then people believed him. Like and then it agreed with him. So you think the more we promise, the more people... No, do. I mean like a small show we talk about something, but we are sure. Or if I say something that you already believe, then you're going to believe me. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Right, okay, so that's one way. Yeah, you say things that people already believe, and then, of course, they trust you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Or they hope to happen. Or maybe, or maybe they hope to happen. Yeah, you, 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 yeah, you go say, for... I will do that. Say, oh my God, it's somebody that wants to do that, what I wish to. You trust them, okay? Well, okay, now, so anyway, remember that this is about getting people to believe that you are trustworthy, that you're a person who knows what they're talking about, a person you can think is reliable, yeah? Maybe this is an extreme uh, example, but if you use terminology that other people don't understand. Does that make you trustworthy or not trustworthy? Can they, I, I, I have to ask this. Can they make them believe what you say just because they don't understand anything like, oh, she, she knows what she's talking about? Some people perhaps fall for that trick. Other people perhaps the opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just you know, using a lot of terms. I have no idea what it's all about. I don't trust him. <laughs> That uh, knowledge is a power. Knowledge is what? Power, power, power. 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 Yeah. Okay. Knowledge is power. Sometimes it is if you use it right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Shall we say uh, appearance? Speak up, please. Appearance. Appearance. Yes. For logos. For logos. For ethos. For ethos. It's better for for ethos, I think. So your appearance could make you trustworthy. Yeah. If you look serious and you are determined in what you say, maybe yeah, your whole manner inspires I trust. More like in the, the, the way we dress. Yeah. Us if I if I you would trust me more if I had a tie and a suit and so on. Yeah, I mean. That <laughs> <laughs> in some circles. You, 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 you have a much more I mean, nervous uh, example. I mean, you are a lecturer, so you don't need to try and. Okay. Yeah.
I think you all get the idea what ethos is, right? It's not about the pathos. Some people say pathos, by the way, but it's usually pathos. Okay, this means that when I'm trying to convince you of something, I want to inspire emotions in you so that you want to do it yourself. So I want to make you enthusiastic in a political decision. Let's say, I all, let's say we want to go to war with another country. So my job is to make you enthusiastic about going to war. <laughs> okay, that, that's a classical situation where people gave this kind of rousing speeches. So pathos is awakening the emotions of people, usually in the direction of what you want them to do. Okay? So, here, good support, logical structure. Here, be trustworthy. Here, awaken enthusiasm for what you want people to do. Okay? Yeah? yeah. Is it culturally biased? Uh, of course. Some, like, uh, when I said you, you, you come with me if you have a tie, but uh, sometimes uh, I didn't mean you by you, but I mean yes. by professors. Yeah. Yeah. If they have high, they are most, much more trustworthy. Or we students in some countries, we have to test like in a, in a specific code. Like yeah. A specific okay. Code, code. One could translate that this, these three things are universal. That, one can argue about whether they're universal or not. But I sort of, I think, weakly believe that they will occur in all cultures. But then, what? is trustworthy is going to vary a lot from culture to culture. So whether wearing a tie and a suit is trustworthy or not will be very different in one culture than another culture. And the same way, what awakens enthusiasm will be different from one place to another. But the, but the idea that you should make people believe you're trustworthy, I think might be universal. Yeah? I was thinking, you said that uh, it was convincing you are trustworthy, but isn't it rather convincing that your argument is trustworthy? Because you give reference to an authority. You sound like Socrates and Plato. <laughs> Thank you. You want to be up here. That's what they would have said. But the Sophists say no. Yes, you, it doesn't happen. My, my, the only thing is, I'll just be trustworthy and then I can lead you anywhere I want, whether my argument is good or not. <laughs> Yes, but I mean, the argument itself needs to be, I mean, I mean, say for example, I reference to an authority. I am trying to um, convince somebody that homosexuality is wrong. Yeah. So I say that it's in the Bible, and the Bible yeah. is you know, a very authoritative book. Right. You trust it, don't you? So therefore, obviously, we need to stop homosexuals. Yeah. That's it, what a rhetor rhetorician would think it's a good way of arguing. But a Socrates, Plato fan would say, that's no good. Yeah, but it doesn't that, that, make it because, the, you know, I, I don't trust the Bible. That's no good argument at yes, all. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, the, but somebody who does trust the Bible would find it a convincing argument. But my point is, wouldn't that be an example of ethos? Because you're trying to establish your own trustworthiness by quoting a very trustworthy you're source. You're trying to establish the trustworthiness of the argument because it's association to authority rather than yourself being uh, authoritative or trustworthy. In this case, yes, you're trying to establish both. Yes, but it is an example of ethos, if that's my point. Well, absolutely, to use, to use uh, authority, authoritative, authoritative sources is uh, one of the classical ways of establishing ethos, of establishing trustworthiness. If you repeat what you believe the audience already believes, you know, especially like religious documents, it's a very good way to give yourself trustworthiness and perhaps also what you're saying. I mean, a lot of, a lot of Christians are, may have not read the Bible. I mean, a lot of actually haven't. So by giving, I mean, by referencing to a document that they you know, put, uh, find, uh, you know, that they trust, you can gain some form of validity. Absolutely, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. It's, a, it's a classical way to do it, actually. Yeah. But isn't that very dependent on your audience? Absolutely. So if you're talking to an audience of Muslims, I mean, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, sure. Yeah, you have to be aware of what your audience is. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's not uh, completely true. Even okay, in, you you believe the Bible. No, no. Even in the <laughs> Quran uh, and the Islamic uh, yeah. religion, it's illegal. Uh, LGBT and homosexuality is. Like, oh, only you're thinking about this particular sinful. claim he made. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, but I mean, you're not going to be convinced uh, because it was said in the Bible, or will you? Sorry. I know the Muslims actually have some respect for all religions that have a book, so maybe you. That's why you would like the Bible, too. But if you were talking to a bunch of atheists, let's say, rather than Muslims, they wouldn't be so impressed. <laughs> yeah. I agree. OK. So a little later on, around 400 AD, 300, 400 AD, people were starting to summarize. I should have said that rhetoric was very popular in Greece, but this popularity was transferred to Rome. So during antiquity, in both Greece and Rome, education, to a large extent, be, meant being educated in rhetoric, how to argue and how to convince people. This was a part of any per a person who went to school had to have large amounts of rhetoric, both written and spoken. <coughs> And so that meant that people wrote new treatises during the Roman Empire. There are, there are treatises by Horace, there are treatises by Cicero, etc. People were pointing out various things about how, how you should argue what you should do. And there were many, many schools of teaching people rhetoric. Okay. So anyway, when we have the, well, around 3400 AD, there is this Roman guy called Quintilian, who, like Aristotle, takes it as a task to summarize what was known about rhetoric at that time. And he included then Aristotle's rhetoric, but he also provided some new things. So one of the things he provided, which is very well known and usually taught in all courses of rhetoric, are five points which aid in the planning of a speech, usually, but in general, of, of, of communication. And okay, so first he has something to say about, let's say somebody says, you have to give a speech tomorrow, or you have to give a lecture tomorrow. He says, oh, I can't do that. Well, then you sit down and you think, what should I do? Okay, so the first thing, <laughs> according to Quintilian, you should look at what he has to say about how you invent what you're going to say. And there you have as a help, what Aristotle, these, play, these cognitive places. In Latin, topoi are called loci, locus, place. And you also have what you may be, what you know about logic, how you can drive, derive conclusions from some, things you, some claims you want to make, etc. So all of this is part of inventio, how to invent what you're going to say. Then you should give what you're going to say a kind of structure, a disposition sometimes is the word used. Okay? And when you do that, there are going to be certain parts. I'm going to come back to these a little more on the next slide, but you can divide a talk into these parts that I have written here. Exordium, narratio, partitio, confirmatio and conclusio, and you can, if you know Latin, you can sort of guess, and we'll come back to that, what they mean. Then, you should think about how you should elaborate whatever you're going to say. Are you going to use uh, metaphors, metonymies, and you do that especially in order to, uh, to awaken the feelings of those that you're talking about, get their enthusiasm. And I shouldn't have mentioned up here, if you do this the right way, the disposition of the talk, this helps you in making the audience believe you are trustworthy, ethos. Then, in antiquity, there was no cheating the way I am doing now. So I have this PowerPoint which aids my memory. That was not allowed in antiquity. You were not allowed to stand and read from a paper. No, you had to learn it by heart. So a very large part of teaching rhetoric was devoted to 
memorization. How, one, once you've invented your talk, how can you memorize it and produce it freely like this? Yeah? Wasn't it in the way that they look down to people that focus on learning how to write instead of people that learn how to do proper rhetorics? Because they thought it was much more uh, specific when you're able to stand in front of an audience and defend yourself and be able to yeah. spontaneously and appropriate react on arguments instead of being able to write a good text where you have hours sitting alone in your apartment and you can rewrite and re-edit over and over again? Correct. Um, Plato, one of Plato's dialogues, Kratilos, is in defense of the, uh, the spoken word against the written word, which is ironic since he was like the first person who actually wrote down dialogues. But he, he defends, actually he thinks that free dialogue where you can change your mind and be influenced by the other person, influence the other person, etc., is much better than if you write down things because then the words and the thoughts, the ideas get imprisoned and they cannot be changed so, so easily. Now, right, that, that had status. And so they produced aids of, for memory, or sometimes it's called antique theories of memory. And the most well-known is the house. You know about the house? So you get into house, and perhaps first you get to the hall, then you get to the kitchen, you get to the dining room, you get to the living room. And in each room, you put a part of your talk. So in this way, you cannot forget. You have to go through these rooms. So when you're standing there, what did I put in the dining room? <laughs> then you produce the dining room part. Then you produce the living room part. OK, there are other, there are other such models. But they, they, they produce various tricks to help people to, to remember what they were going to say. OK, <clears throat> so that's memoria. And then we have pronuncia, action. How are you going to actually do, deliver the talk. And so, how are you going to use your hands? How are you going to use eye contact? How are you going to use your voice? And, interesting enough, how are you going to use your feet? This is important. <laughs> so, they have directions about foot stomp. So, they, they, you know, it's, it's a pretty holistic view of what it is to, to uh, argue. Clothes are part of this. The whole thing. Appearance. What should you do to be trustworthy, to awaken pathos, and to uh, yeah, have good logos. Oh, logos, ethos, pathos. We're all aided by these things. <clears throat> so let's look a little more now in detail, especially at the dispositio, the plan of talk. So the first part is the exordium where you are supposed to awaken sympathy for yourself and your topic. So this is basic trustworthiness. Believe me, I'm an honest soul. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> okay. That's the exordium. Then you tell people what you are talking about. Your claim, your topic, that's called narratio. Uh, then you will tell people about how your talk is going to be structured and relevant background for what you're saying. That's called partizio. Then you present reasons for why people should believe this. Support for your arguments, what you were calling leverage. That comes in here. So you, you're supposed to confirmatio. This confirms what you're claiming. And there should be one, I think I missed one out. Yeah, there should be another one called refutatio also. That's where you think about the counter arguments that another person might have. And you meet that person's arguments. So you give counter arguments to the counter arguments. That, I, I, there's one more part here, which is, which is called refutatio. OK. Oh, no, I, maybe I have it down here. No? Anyway. So then, in conclusio, when you come to the end, you summarize what you've been talking about, so that people will remember the main points of what you said. Okay, when we come to elocutio, yeah, you can see, I think I said this before, metaphor, metonymy, very important to catch and keep attention, 
wish to continue listening in the audience, they must understand, they must agree to what you're saying. Yeah, I think the rest of the I already said in connection with the previous slide. Okay, so this this is uh, still part of all training and rhetoric to think of these things as you plan a speech. And when when you uh, you will in this course be given the task to analyze speeches and so on, keep these things in mind because they are still relevant. Okay, what, another way to analyze a classical speech is to use what we were teaching you last term, namely activity-based communication analysis. So let's take the typical scene where you give a speech. So the activity is a public speech. And if you look at the various factors that we have in this activity-based communication analysis, we then ask, what is the purpose? Well, the purpose is usually then persuasion, to trigger emotions, to trigger agreement, and the roles are typically the speaker and the audience. The artifacts are such things as voice, loudspeakers, screen projection, environment, usually a large room, an arena, podium, it could also be done over mass media, over TV or radio. Uh, actually, in the 1930s, 40s, there was an interesting new angle to this because classically talks had been given in a big open space. But the radio introduced a new possibility. You could sit in a small room and talk to the whole nation. So, if you go to America, President Roosevelt introduced a fireside chat where he sat and talked informally to the American nation. Now compare his style of speaking to Hitler's or Churchill's. Hitler and Churchill are both still in the old paradigm of talking to a crowd, you know, with elegant formulations where, where you're supposed to yeah, convince the whole big crowd. Roosevelt is not doing it that way. He's talking like but in a more personal and informal way, but it's still to the American nation, which was a new angle on this thing. <clears throat> the emphasis is on the speaker's own view and arguments, and there's actually less attention in public speaking to other people's views, except maybe in a few cases where you have political debate and you know in advance what your opponents are going to say. Then you try to also think of counter-arguments to what they are saying. Okay, you can use the same approach if you want to look at written argumentation. So here instead the activity will be written argumentation. The purpose again will be persuasion, trigger emotions, agreement. Roles here are not speaker and listeners now, but instead author and readers. The artifacts and instruments, written text, diagrams, pictures. The environment can vary a lot. It's very hard to say where you can read. You can read in most places. And you can read silently, and sometimes you can also read publicly, aloud. In fact, in antiquity, this was the usual model. People, we would talk about distrust of people who used reading and writing in antiquity. One of the things people distrusted was people who read silently. And um, because they usually had sli slaves who would read the, uh, whatever the text was aloud to them. Julius Caesar was noted for reading silently. And people thought, that's very strange. How can he read silently? <laughs> he should have a slave reading to it. Okay. Um, the problem here is, of course, not knowing who the reader will be. That's always a problem for anybody who's right. Who's going to read this? How should I formulate it? <laughs> Emphasis on the speaker's own views and arguments. Less attention to other people's views. But, again, in argumentative texts, you, you find this more attention to what possible counter-arguments are, and then counter-arguments to the counter-arguments. Let's see. Okay, the classical purpose of argumentation is finding truth 
through dialectical organization. So we find already far back an idea which is connected with dialectical organization. I say yes, you say no. I am for something, you are against it. The pro-contra argumentation style has a, has a long history from antiquity and up to our days. And in dialectics, especially in the Hegelian Marxist tradition, they always use these words, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So I speak in favor of the idea that, let's say, the moon is a big yellow cheese, you speak against, and we argue for a while, and after we have argued for a while, then synthesis comes up, some kind of weeding out what is true in both positions, and this rises up to a third position which captures both. This, this was Hegel's idea of the development of history, but it's also the, uh, let's say, normative idea of, of what would happen in a good academic seminar. The opponents meet, they argue, and after a while the truth comes slowly out and as a kind of third position covering both. Okay? So, here the classical purpose is finding truth by arguing better than the opponents. And you have Rawls arguing for, for a position and Ra arguing against the position. And artifacts here, instruments, are using logic, evidence. It, this can happen anywhere, but it can also happen in a big public arena, or it can happen typically in an academic seminar. And here there is more focus on both your own arguments and on what your opponents are saying. In fact, one of the big purposes of this is to meet by counter-argument what other people are saying against you. So counter-arguments against counter-arguments. Okay, I can see that we have more or less come to the end of today's lecture. So on Friday, we're going to continue and we'll go into some more aspects of this. And as I said, it'll be a little more technical than it has been today. Thank you. So get ready for that. Okay, thank you.